chapter three of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three at camp de squatook part one the next morning we got off at a good hour for the last half mile of its course we found beardsley brook so overgrown with alders that we had to chop and haul our way through it with infinite labor here we wasted some time fishing for sam's pipe which had fallen overboard among the alders the pipe was black with crooked stem plethoric in build and so heavy that we all thought it would sink where it fell as soon as the catastrophe occurred we halted till the water here about two feet deep had become clear then peering down among the alder stems ranolf spied the pipe on the sandy bottom looking blurred and distorted through the writhing current long we grappled for it poking at it with pole and paddle we would cautiously raise it a little way towards the surface but even as we began to triumph it would wriggle off again as if actually alive and settle languidly back upon the sand we all knew without ranolf's elaborate explanations that its lifelike movement was due to its being so little heavier than the water it displaced or to the uneven refraction of the light through the moving fluid or to some other equally satisfactory and scientific cause finally sam getting impatient plunged an arm and shoulder and grasped the pipe victoriously he came up empty-handed and we beheld a huge tadpole now thoroughly aroused flaunting off downstream in high dudgeon ranolf remarked that the laws of refaction were to him obscure and we continued our journey the real pipe we overtook farther downstream floating along jauntily as a cork once out upon the squatook river our course was rapid for the current was swift and the channel clear there were some wild rapids but we ran them victoriously by noon we were on the bosom of big squatook lake by six o'clock we had traversed this beautiful and solitary water and were pitching our tent near the outlet on a soft brown carpet of pine needles here was a circular opening amid the huge trunks between the lake and our encampment hung a screen of alder and wild cherry whence a white beach of pebbles slanted broadly to the waves while stranian and queerman made preparations for supper the rest of us whipped the ripples of the outlet for trout the shores of the lake at this spot draw together in two grand curves and at the apex flows out the squatook river about waist deep and a stone's throw broad it murmurs pleasantly on for the first few rods and then begins to dart and chafe and lift an angry voice hither the indians come to spear whitefish in their season to assist their spearing they had the outlet fenced part way across with a double row of stakes all but the smallest fish were thus compelled to descend through a narrow passage wherein they were at the mercy of the spearmen this fence we now found very convenient letting the canoe drift against it we perched on top of the stakes a couple of feet above water and cast our flies unimpeded in every direction the trout were abundant and took the flies freely for an hour we had most exciting sport it was in itself for all true fishermen worth the whole journey the squatook trout are of a good average size and very game of the twenty odd fish we killed that evening there were two that passed the one and a half pound scratch upon our scales and several that cleared the pound deciding to spend some days in this fair spot we named it camp de squatook lopping the lower branches of the trees we made ourselves pegs on which to hang our tins and other utensils while a dry cedar log split skilfully by stranion furnished us with slabs for a table our commissariat was well supplied with campers necessities and luxuries but it was upon trout above all that we feasted sometimes we boiled them sometimes we broiled them more often we fried them in the fragrant yellow cornmeal the delicate richness of the hot pink luscious flakes is only to be realized by those who feast on the spoils of their own rods with the relish of free air and vigor and outdoor appetites campers prate much of early hours and of seeking their blankets with sunset but we held to no such doctrine night in these wilds is rich with a mysterious beauty an immensity of solitude such as day cannot dream of supper over we stretched ourselves out between tent door and campfire pillowing our heads on the folded bedding across the yellow firelit circle through the trunks and hanging branches we watched the still gleaming level of the lake 
whence at intervals would ring out startlingly clear the goblin laughter of the loon we were not so tired as on the previous evening and it took us longer to settle down into the mood for story-telling at last Ranian was called upon he was ready and speech flowed from him at once as if his mouth had been uncorked a night encounter i'll tell you a tale said he of this very spot on this very big squatook and of course with me and the panther both in it once upon a time that is to say in the summer of eighteen eighty six i fished over these waters with tom allison you remember he was visiting fredericton nearly all that year we camped right here two days and then went on to the little lake or second squatook just below one moonlit night when the windless little lake before our camp was like a shield of silver and the woody mountains enclosing us seemed to hold their breath for delight i was seized with an overwhelming impulse to launch the canoe and pull myself up here to big squatook the distance between the two lakes is about a mile and a half with rapid water almost all the way and allison who had been amusing himself laboriously all day was too much in love with his pipe and blankets by the campfire to think of accompanying me all my persuasions were wasted upon him so i went alone of course i had an excuse i wanted to set night lines for the gray trout or toad which haunt the waters of big squatook a favorite feeding ground of theirs is just where the water begins to shoal toward the outlet yonder strange as it may seem the toke are never taken in second lake or in any other of the squatook chain it was a weird journey upstream i can tell you the narrow river full of rapids but so free from rocks in this part of its course that its voice seldom rises above a loud purring whisper was overhung by many ancient trees through the spaces between their tops fell the moonlight in sharp white patches as the long slow thrusts of my pole forced the canoe stealthily upward against the current the creeping panorama of the banks seemed full of elvish and noiseless life white trunks slipped into shadow and black stumps caught gleams of sudden radiance till the strangeness of it all began to impress me more than its beauty and i felt a curious and growing sense of danger i even cast a longing thought backward toward the campfire's cheer and my lazier comrade and when at length slipping out upon the open bosom of the lake i put aside my pole and grasped my paddle i drew a breath of distinct relief it took but a few minutes to place my three night lines this done i paddled with slow strokes toward that big rock farther out yonder the broad surface was as unrippled as a mirror like it is now save where my paddle and the gliding prow disturbed it when i floated motionless and the canoe drifted softly beyond the petty turmoil of my paddle it seemed as if i were hanging suspended in the centre of a blue and starry sphere the magic of the water so persuaded me that presently i hauled up my canoe on the rock took off my clothes and swam far out into the liquid stillness the water was cold but of a life-giving freshness and when i had dressed and resumed my paddle i felt full of spirit for the wild dash home to camp through the purring rapids and the spectral woods little did i dream just how wild that dash was to be you know the whitefish barrier where you fellows were fishing this evening well at the time of my visit the barrier extended only to mid-channel one half having been carried away probably by logs in the spring freshets for this accident doubtless very annoying to the indians i soon had every reason to be grateful as i paddled noiselessly into the funnel and began to feel the current gathering speed beneath me and noted again the confused mysterious glimmer and gloom of the forest into which i was drifting i once more felt that unwanted sense of danger stealing over me with a word of vexation i shook it off and began to paddle fiercely at the same instant my eyes grown keen and alert detected something strange about the bit of indian fence which i was presently to pass it was surely very high and massive in its outer section i stayed my paddle yet kept slipping quickly nearer then suddenly i arrested my progress with a few mighty backward strokes lying crouched flat along the tops of the stakes its head low down its eyes fixed upon me was a huge panther 
i was completely at a loss and for a minute or two remained just where i was backing water to resist the current and trying to decide what was best to be done as long as i kept to the open water of course i was quite safe but i didn't relish the idea of spending the night on the lake i knew enough of the habits and characteristics of the panther to be aware the brute would keep his eye on me as long as i remained alone but what i didn't know was how far a panther could jump could i safely paddle past that fence by hugging the farther shore i felt little inclined to test the question practically so i turned about and paddled out upon the lake then i drifted and shouted songs and stirred up the echoes for a good round hour i hoped rather faintly that the panther would follow me up the shore this in truth he may have done but when i paddled back to the outlet there he was awaiting me in exactly the same position as when i first discovered him by this time i had persuaded myself that there was ample room for me to pass the barrier without coming in range of the animal's spring i knew that close to the farther shore the water was deep when i was about thirty yards from the stakes i put on speed heading for just about the middle of the opening my purpose was to let the panther fancy that i was coming within his range and then to change my course at the last moment so suddenly that he would not have time to alter his plan of attack it is quite possible that this carefully planned scheme was unnecessary and that i rated the brute's intelligence and forethought quite too high but however that may be i thought it safer not to take any risks with so cunning an adversary the panther lay in the sharp black shadow so that it was impossible for me to note his movements accurately but just as an instinct warned me that he was about to spring i swerved smartly toward him and hurled the light canoe forward with the mightiest stroke i was capable of the manoeuvre was well executed for just before i came fairly opposite the grim figure on the stake tops the panther sprang instinctively i threw myself forward level with the crossbars and in the same breath there came a snarl and a splash close beside me the brute had miscalculated my speed and got himself a ducking i chuckled a little as i straightened up but the sigh of relief which i drew at the same time was profound in its sincerity i had lamentably underestimated the reach of the panther's spring he had alighted close to the water's edge just where i imagined the canoe would be out of reach i looked around again he was climbing alertly out of the hated bath giving himself one mighty shake he started after me down along the bank uttering a series of harsh and piercing screams with a sweep of the paddle i darted across current and placed almost the full breadth of the river between my enemy and myself i have paddled many a canoe race but never one that my heart was so set upon winning as this strange one in which i now found myself straining every nerve the current of the squatook varies greatly in speed though nowhere is it otherwise than brisk at first i gained rapidly on my pursuer but presently we reached a spot where the banks were comparatively level and open and here the panther caught up and kept abreast of me with ease with a sudden sinking at the heart i called to mind a narrow gorge a quarter of a mile ahead from the sides of which several drooping trunks hung over the water from one of these i thought the panther might easily reach me running out and dropping into the canoe as i darted beneath the idea was a blood-curdling one and spurred me to more desperate effort but before we neared the perilous pass the banks grew so uneven and the underbrush so dense that my pursuer was much delayed and consequently fell behind the current quickening its speed at the same time i was a good ten yards in the lead as my canoe slid through the gorge and out into the white moonlight of one of the wider stretches of the stream here i slackened my pace in order to recover my wind and the panther made up his lost ground for the time i was out of his reach and all he could do was to scream savagely this i supposed was to summon his mate to the noble hunting he had provided for her but to my inexpressible satisfaction no mate came the beauty and the weirdness of the moonlit woods were now quite lost upon me i saw only that long fierce light bounding figure which so inexorably kept pace with me to save my powers for some possible emergency i resolved to content myself for the time with a very moderate degree of haste 
the panther was in no way pressed to keep up with me suddenly he darted forward at his utmost speed for a moment this did not trouble me but then i awoke to its possible meaning he was planning evidently an ambuscade and i must keep an eye upon him the order of the chase was promptly reversed and i set out at once in a desperate pursuit the obstructed shores and the increasing current favoured me so that he found it hard to shake me off for the next half mile i just managed to keep up with him then came another of those quieter reaches and my pursued pursuer at last got out of sight again i paused not only to take breath but to try and discover the brute's purpose in leaving me all at once it flashed into my mind just before the river widens into second lake there occurs a lively and somewhat broken rapid as there was moonlight and i knew the channels well i had no dread of this rapid till suddenly i remembered three large boulders crossing the stream like stepping-stones it was plain to me that this was the point my adversary was anxious to reach ahead of me these boulders were so placed that he could easily spring from one to the other dry shod and his chance of intercepting me would be excellent i almost lost courage the best thing i could do under the circumstances was to save my strength to the utmost so for a time i did little more than steer the canoe when at last i rounded a turn and saw just ahead of me the white thin-crested singing ripples of the rapid i was not at all surprised to see also the panther crouched on one of the rocks in midstream at this point the river was somewhat spread out and the banks were low so the moonlight showed me the channel quite clearly you'll understand better when we run through in a day or two i laid aside my paddle and took up the more trusty white spruce pole with it i snubbed the canoe firmly letting her drop down the slope inch by inch while i took a cool and thorough survey of the ripples and cross currents from the sloping shoulder of the rock lying nearest to the left-hand bank a strong cross current took a slant sharply over toward the middle channel i decided to stake my fate on the assistance of this cross current gradually i snubbed the canoe over to the left bank and then gave her her head the shores slipped past the rocks with that crouching sentinel on the central one seemed to glide upstream to meet me i was almost in the passage when with a superb bound the panther shot through the moonlight and lit upon the rock i was approaching as he poised himself gaining his balance with some difficulty on the narrow foothold a strong lunge with my pole twisted the canoe into the swirl of that cross current and with the next thrust i slid like lightning down the middle channel before my adversary had more than got himself fairly turned around with a shout of exultation i raced down the rest of the incline and into widening reaches safe from pursuit the panther screaming angrily followed me for a time but soon the receding shores placed such a distance between us that i ceased to regard him presently i bade him a final farewell and headed across the lake for the spot where the campfire was waving me a ruddy welcome well that's getting pretty near home remarked ranolf glancing apprehensively into the gloom behind the camp you don't suppose that chap would be waiting around here for you stranion if so i hope he won't mistake me for you let sam give us something cheerful now demanded magnus well said sam i'll give you a story of the lumber camps i'll call it bruin and the cook as the o m is going to dress up our yarns for the cold light of print i must be allowed to preface the story with a few introductory remarks on the life of the lumberman in winter stranion and the o m know all about that but the rest of you fellows never go to the lumber camps you know to one who visits the winter camps here in our backwoods the life led by the loggers is likely to seem monotonous after the strangeness of it has worn off the sounds of the chopping the shouting the clanking of the teams afford ample warning to all the wild creatures of the woods who thereupon generally agree in giving a wide berth to a neighbourhood which has suddenly grown so populous and noisy in chopping and hauling logs the lumbermen are at work unremittingly from dawn until sundown and at night they have little energy to expend on the hunting of bears or panthers 
the bunks and the blankets exert an overwhelming attraction and by the time the men have concluded their after-supper smoke and the sound of a few rough songs has died away the wild beasts may creep near enough to smell the pork and beans and may prowl about the camp until dawn with small fear of molestation from the sleepers within at intervals however the monotony of camp life is broken something occurs to remind the careless woodsmen that though in the wilderness indeed they are yet not truly of it they are made suddenly aware of those shy but savage forces which regarding them ever as trespassers have been keeping them under an angry and eager surveillance the spirit of the violated forest makes a swift and sometimes effectual but always unexpected stroke for vengeance a yoke of oxen are straining at their load a great branch reaching down catches the nearest ox by the horn and the poor brute falls in its track with its neck broken a stout sapling is bent to the ground by a weight of ice and snow some thaw or the shock of a passing team releases it and by the fierce recoil a horse's leg is shattered a lumberman has strayed off into the woods by himself perchance to gather spruce gum for his friends in the settlements and he is found days afterwards half eaten by bears and foxes a solitary chopper throws down his axe and leans against a tree to rest and dream and a panther drops from the branches above and tears him yet such vengeance is accomplished but seldom and makes no permanent impression on the heedless woodsman his onward march is inexorable the cook it must be borne in mind is a most important personage in the lumber camp this i say of camp cooks in general and i assert it in particular of the cook who figures as one of the heroes of my story the other hero is the bear it was a bright march morning at nicholson's camp over on salmon river there had been a heavy thaw for some days and the snow banks under the eaves of the camp were shrinking rapidly the bright chips about the door the trampled straw and fodder around the stable were steaming and soaking under the steady sun such winds as were stirring abroad that day were quite shut off from the camp by the dark surrounding woods from the protruding stovepipe which did duty as a chimney a faint blue wreath of smoke curled lazily the cook had the camp all to himself for a while for the teams and choppers were at work a mile away and uh, the cookie as the cook's assistant is called had betaken himself to a neighbouring pond to fish for trout through the ice the dishes were washed the camp was in order and in a little while all would be time to get the dinner ready the inevitable pork and beans were slowly boiling and an appetizing fragrance was abroad on the quiet air the cook decided to snatch a wink of sleep in his bunk beneath the eaves he had a spare half hour before him and under his present circumstances he knew no better way of spending it the weather being mild he left the camp door wide open and swinging up to his berth soon had himself luxuriously bedded in blankets his own and as many of other fellows blankets as he liked he began to doze and dream he dreamed of summer fields and then of a lively sunday school picnic and at last of the music of a band which he heard crashing in his ears then the cymbals and the big drum grew unbearably loud and waking with a start he remembered where he was and thrust his head in astonishment over the edge of the bunk the sight that met his eyes filled him with alarm and indignation the prolonged thaw had brought out the bears from their snug winter quarters and now in a very bad humour from having been waked up too soon they were prowling round the forest in unusual numbers food was scarce in fact times were very hard with them and they were not only bad-tempered but lean and hungry withal to one particularly hungry bear the smell of our cook's simmering pork had come that morning like the invitation to a feast the supposed invitation had been accepted with a rapturous alacrity bruin had found the door open the coast clear the quarters very inviting with the utmost good faith he had entered upon his fortune to find the source of that entrancing fragrance had been to his trained nose a simple matter while cook slept sweetly bruin had rooted off the cover of the pot and this was the beginning of cook's dream but the pot was hot and the first mouthful of the savoury mess made him yell with rage and pain 
at this point the trumpets and clarions grew shrill in cook's dreaming ears then an angry sweep of the great paw had dashed pot and kettle off the stove in a thunder of crashing iron and clattering tins this was the point at which cook's dream had attained overwhelming reality what met his round-eyed gaze as he sat up in his blankets was an angry bear dancing about in a confusion of steam and smoke and beans and kettles making ineffectual snatches at a lump of scalding pork upon the floor after a moment of suspense cook rose softly and crept to the other end of the bunks where a gun was kept to his disgust the weapon was unloaded but the click of the lock had caught the bear's attention glancing up at the bunk above him the brute's eyes detected the shrinking cook and straightway he overflowed with wrath here evidently was the author of his discomfort with smarting jaws and a vengeful pause he made a dash for the bunk its edge was nearly seven feet from the floor so bruin had to do some clambering as his head appeared over the edge and his great paws took firm hold upon the clapboard rim of the bunk cook now grown desperate struck at him wildly with the heavy butt of the gun but bruin is always a skilful boxer with an upward stroke he warded off the blow and sent the weapon spinning across the camp at the same time however his weight proved too much for the frail clapboard to which he was holding and back he fell on the floor with a shock like an earthquake this repulse which of course he credited to the cook only filled him with tenfold greater fury and at once he sprang back to the assault but the delay however brief had given poor cook time to grasp an idea which he proceeded to act upon with eagerness he saw that the hole in the roof through which the stovepipe protruded was large enough to give his body passage snatching at a light rafter above his head he swung himself out of the bunk and kicked the stovepipe from its place the sections fell with loud clatter upon the stove and the bear for a moment disconcerting bruin's plans from the rafter it was an easy reach to the opening in the roof and as bruin gained the empty bunk and stretched his paw eagerly up toward his intended victim on the rafter the intended victim slipped with the greatest promptitude through the hole at this point the cook drew a long breath and persuaded his heart to go down out of his throat where it had been since he waked and resume its proper functions his first thought was to drop from the roof and run for help but fortunately he changed his mind the bear was no fool no sooner had the cook got safely out upon the roof than bruin rushed forth from the camp door expecting to catch him as he came down had cook acted upon his first impulse he would have been overtaken before he had gone a hundred yards and would have perished hideously in the snow as it was however evidently to bruin's deep chagrin he stuck close to the chimney hole like a prairie dog sitting by his burrow ready at a moment's notice to plunge within while the bear stalked deliberately twice around the camp eyeing him and evidently laying plans as it were for his capture at last the bear appeared to make up his mind at one corner of the shanty piled up nearly to the eaves was a store of firewood which a cookie had gathered in upon this pile bruin mounted and then made a dash up the creaking roof cook prayed most fervently that it might give way beneath the great weight of the bear and to see if it would do so he waited almost too long but it did not as he scurried belated through the hole the bear's paw reached its edge and the huge claws tore nearly all the flesh from the back of the poor fellow's hand bleeding and trembling he crouched upon the friendly rafter not daring to swing down into the bunk the agility of that great animal was marvellous scarcely had cook got under shelter when bruin rushed in again at the door and was up on the bunk again in a twinkling and again cook vanished by the chimney-place a moment later the bear was again on the roof while cook once more crouched back faintly on his rafter this performance was repeated several times till for cook it had quite ceased to be interesting at last the chase grew monotonous even to the indefatigable bruin who then resolved upon a change of tactics after driving cook out through the chimney he decided to try the same mode of exit for himself or at least to thrust his head through the opening and see what it was like 
embracing the woodwork with his powerful forepaws he swung himself up on the rafter as he had seen cook do so gracefully the attempt was quite successful but the rafter was not prepared for the strain and bruin and beam came thundering to the floor as cook gazed down through the hole and marked what had happened his heart sank utterly within him his one safe retreat was gone but bruin did not perceive his advantage or else was in no hurry to follow it up the shock had greatly dampened his zeal he sat on his haunches by the stove and gazed up sullenly at cook while cook gazed back despairingly at him then the bear noticed that the precious pork had got deliciously cool and in the charms of that rare morsel cook was soon quite forgotten all cook had to do was to lie on the roof nursing his lacerated hand and watch bruin as he made away with the lumberman's dinner a labor of love in which he lost no time at this junction a noise was heard in the woods and hope came back to the cook's heart the men were returning for dinner bruin heard it too and made haste to gulp down the remnant of the beans just as teams and choppers emerged into the little cleared space in front of the camp bruin having swallowed his last mouthful rushed out of the camp door to the breathless and immeasurable amazement of the lumberman finding himself to all appearances surrounded bruin paused a moment irresolutely then charging upon the nearest team he dealt the teamster a terrific cuff bowling him over in the snow and breaking his arm while the maddened horses plunged reared and fell over backward in a tangle of sleds and traces and lashing heels this episode brought the woodsmen to their senses axe in hand they closed in upon the bear who rose on his hindquarters to meet them the first few blows that were delivered at him with all the force of practised arms and vindictive energy he warded off as if they were so many feathers but he could not guard himself on all sides at once a well-directed blow from the rear sank the axe head deep between his fore shoulders severing the spinal column and bruin collapsed a furry heap upon the crimsoned snow in their indignation over the cook's torn hand their comrade's broken arm and perhaps most aggravating of all their thoroughly demolished dinner the lumbermen undertook to make a meal of bruin but in this attempt bruin found a measure of revenge for in death he proved to be even tougher than he had been in life and the famous luxury of a fat bear steak was nowhere to be had from his carcass and now magnus continued sam cleaning out his pipe we'll have something remote and tropical from you with your kind permission what else has happened to that uncle of yours well, lots of things said the imperturbable magnus i'll tell you one of his mexican stories which he calls an encounter with peccaries end of chapter three part one chapter three of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three at camp de Squatook, part two an encounter with peccaries this is as near as i can remember the way he told it to me i speak in his name in my somewhat varied wanderings over the surface of this fair round world said my uncle i have had adventures more or less exciting and generally disagreeable with wolves bears and tigers with irate and undiscriminating bulls and with at least one of those painfully unpleasant horses who have acquired a special relish for human flesh some childish memories moreover disclose to me at times that on more than one occasion i have come off without laurels from a contest with an indignant he-goat and that i have even been in peril at the wings of an unusually aggressive gander but of all the unpleasant acquaintances to make when one is feeling solitary and unprotected i think a herd of irritated peccaries will carry off the palm let these sturdy little animals once conceive that their rights have been ever so little menaced and they are tireless implacable and blindly fearless in their demand for vengeance just what they may interpret as a menace to their rights i suppose no man can say with any confidence but my own observation has led me to believe that they think themselves entitled to possess the earth 
the earth is much to be congratulated upon the fact that various climatic considerations have hitherto prevented them from entering upon their inheritance the peccary is confined i believe and i state it here on the authority of reputable naturalists to certain tropical and subtropical regions of the new world my own limited acquaintance with the creature was gained in mexico toward the end of the seventies i was engaged upon a survey of government lands in one of the interior provinces of mexico our party was enjoying life and troubled by few cares there were no bandits in that region the scanty inhabitants were more than well disposed they were ready to bow down before us in their deferential good will the climate though emphatically warm was healthful and stimulating there were hardly enough pumas in the neighborhood to add to our content the zest of excitement there were peccaries as we were told in admonition but we had seen no sign of them and when we learned that they were only a kind of small wild pig we took little stock in the tales we heard of their unrelenting ferocity on one of our numerous holidays we could not work our peons on any saint's day be it remembered a rumor of a remarkable waterfall adorning a tributary of the stream which meandered past our camp had taken me a longish ride into the foothills of the sierra my journey was along a little frequented trail leading into the mountains and the scenery was fascinating in its loveliness i found the waterfall easily enough for the trail led past its very brink and i was more than rewarded for the trifling fatigue of my ride a vigorous stream rolling from a winding ravine in such a manner that it seemed to burst right out of the mountain side leaped sparkling and clamouring into the air from a curtain of emerald foliage and fell a distance of nearly two hundred feet into a very valley of paradise in this valley down into the bosom of which i gazed from my height the stream lingered to form a sapphire lakelet around whose banks grew the most luxuriant of tree ferns and mahoganies and mesquites garlanded with gorgeous bloomed lianas i could hear the cries of parrots rising from the splendid coverts and i thought what a delicious retreat the valley would be but for its assortment of snakes miasma and a probable puma or two i enjoyed this scene from my post but i did not descend then i turned my face homeward well content the horse i rode requires more than a passing mention for he played the most prominent and most heroic part in the adventure which befell me on my way home he was a superb beast a blood bay whom i had bought in the city of mexico from an american engineer who was leaving the country the animal who answered to the name of diaz had seen plenty of service in the interior of mexico and his trained instincts had kept me out of many dangers i loved diaz as a faithful friend and servant as i descended from the foothills the trail grew heavy and soft making our progress slow the land was open a succession of rank meadows with clumps of trees dotted here and there and pools on either side of the trail suddenly some distance in my rear there arose a shrill menacing chorus of grunts and squeals at which i would fain have paused to listen but diaz recognized the sounds and bounded forward instantly with every sign of apprehension then i said to myself it must be those peccaries of which i've heard so much in a moment or two i realized that it certainly was those peccaries they swarmed out of the rank herbage and dashed after us gnashing their jaws and though diaz was doing his best the herd gained upon us rapidly they galloped lightly over the soft soil wherein diaz sank far above his fetlocks it took me but a moment to realize when at last face to face with them that the peccaries were just as dangerous as they had been represented and another moment sufficed to show me that escape by my present tactics was impossible i was armed with a light breech-loading rifle a remington and a brace of smith and wesson were sticking in my belt wheeling in my saddle i took a snap shot at the pursuing herd and one of the animals tumbled in his tracks his fellows took no notice of this whatever then i marked that diaz appreciated our plight for he was trembling under me i looked about me almost despairing of escape a little behind nearly halfway between us and the peccaries i saw a wide-spreading tree close to the trail we had passed it at the first of the alarm ahead as far as i could see there was no such refuge plenty of trees there were indeed but all standing off amid the swamps 
i decided at once upon a somewhat desperate course i turned diaz about and charged down upon the peccaries with a yell this stratagem appeared exactly to my horse's state in fact his attitude made me rather uncomfortable he seemed suddenly distraught he gave several short whinnying cries of challenge or defiance and rushed on with his mouth wide open and his lips rolled back in a fashion that made him look fiendish my design was to swing myself from the saddle into the tree that overhung the trail and so give diaz a chance to run away when free of my weight but diaz seemed bent on carrying the war into the enemy's country i took one more shot at the peccaries who seemed no whit dismayed by the onset of diaz i dropped my rifle and kicked my feet out of the stirrups by this time we were under the tree and the peccaries with wild squeals were leaping upon us i had just succeeded in grasping a branch above my head and was swinging myself up when i saw diaz spring into the air and come down with his forefeet upon one of the grunting herd the brute's back was broken almost in the same instant my brave steed's teeth had made short work of another peccary but his flanks were streaming with blood and the dauntless animals were literally climbing upon him and ripping his hide with their short keen tusks i emptied my revolvers rapidly and half a dozen animals dropped but this made no appreciable difference in their numbers meanwhile diaz had gathered himself together and then lashing out desperately before and behind had shaken himself free he sprang clear of the pack and galloped off up the trail toward the mountains the peccaries pursued him but a few paces and then returned to besiege my tree of refuge giving me an excellent opportunity for revolver practice as i was refilling my emptied chambers i heard a snorting screech coming down the trail and there to my amazement was diaz returning to the charge but could that terrible-looking beast be my gentle diaz his eyes seemed like blazing coals and his great jaws were dripping with blood the peccaries darted joyously into the fray but diaz went right through and over them like a whirlwind mangling i know not how many in his course and disappeared down the trail on the homeward road his charges had been murderous but there were still plenty of my adversaries left to make my beleaguerment all too effective i gazed wistfully after my heroic horse and then perched securely astride a branch i continued my revolver practice the peccaries never heeding the diminution of their ranks and disdaining to notice their wounds kept scrambling on one another's shoulders and thrusting their malignant snouts high into the air in the hope of coming at me and satiating their revenge in the course of half an hour my little stock of cartridges used deliberately and effectively was gone but so as i congratulated myself were most of the peccaries there were still half a dozen however and these as far as my imprisonment was concerned were as bad as fourscore these were incorruptible jailers and i feared lest their ceaseless angry cries might summon another herd to their assistance when a couple of hours had passed i grew deeply disgusted and began to plan my camping arrangements for the night in the act of tying some branches together to make myself a safe couch i caught the welcome sound of voices approaching it was my party out in search of me the arrival of diaz torn bloody-mouthed and in a wild excitement had of course given them a terrible alarm and they had set off without delay hardly expecting to find me alive a few shots from their rifles broke up the siege and the meagre remnant of the peccaries fled into the swamps when i got back to camp i found that none of the peons dared to do anything for diaz or even to approach him he was so furious and so erratic to me he was submissive though with an effort i dressed his wounds and gave him a heavy dose of aloes and in a day or two he was himself again but i believe he was on the verge of going mad when magnus ceased i murmured i only hope your uncle's adventures will last right through this trip and now said sam we'll call on queerman for something of a tender and idyllic tone huh queerman all right was the reply and i'll show you sam that i too know something of the lumber camps listen to a gentle idol of a lost camp in the lumber camps they still talk about the great midwinter thaw that wrought such havoc ten years back 
it came on without warning about the last week in february there had been heavy snowfalls in the early part of the winter and all through that district the snows were deep and soft before the thaw came to an end these great snow masses were dwindled to almost nothing and the ice had gone out of the rivers in a series of tremendous floods for the lumber thieves the thaw was a magnificent opportunity of which they had made haste to avail themselves having no stumpage dues to pay they could afford a little extra outlay for the difficult hauling they were comparatively secure from interruption and the opening of the streams gave them an opportunity of quickly getting their spoils out of the way one of the most important camps of the district at that time was that of the reichert company on the little st francis on a saturday morning the fourth day of the thaw word was brought into camp that the thieves were having a delightful time over on lake pikiwakaganomi on the company's timber limits steve doyle the boss of the camp immediately called for volunteers to attempt the capture of the marauders every man at once came forward with the exception of the cook and the boss in order to excite no jealousies made his selection by lot in half an hour the squad was ready to set out be you a goin along sir inquired one of the hands why of course exclaimed doyle mcgann will be in charge here while we're gone there's such a thing possible as a brush with them fellows though i don't anticipate no trouble with em i reckon they're relyin on the thaw to keep em from being interrupted i thought responded the man who had just spoken as how the little feller might come out to camp to-day along of mart and you mightn't want to miss him he ain't been here for more'n a month now and we're all kind of expectin him to-day you can depend on us to make a good job of it ef so be as you'd like to stay by the camp the hands all knows you too well to think you stay home on account of being skeered anyways at this there was a general laugh for doyle's reckless courage was famous in all the camps no said the boss after a thoughtful pause it's my place to go and not to stay anyways i'm not lookin for arty to-day his grandmother ain't goin to let him come when the road's so bad no he continued with renewed emphasis this ain't no time for arty in the woods without more discussion the band picked up their dunnage and their guns and set out for the lake of the unpronounceable name it is needless to say the name became much shortened in their careless lingo on state occasions they sometimes took pains to pronounce it peckagomic for everyday use they found gomic quite sufficient about the time the expedition was setting out from the reichert camp far away in beardsley settlement a very small boy was being tucked comfortably into the straw and bearskins of a roomy pung as his grandmother kissed the round expectant little face she said to the driver a slim youth of perhaps eighteen do you think now mart the goin won't be too bad be you sure the pung ain't likely to slump down and upset and then there's the ice this warm spell must have made it pretty rotten will it be safe crossing the streams somehow or other i do just hate lettin arty go along this mornin don't you be worryin a mite marm responded mart babcock gathering up the reins there ain't no ice to cross seein there ain't no rivers in our route except the saugus and that's got a bridge to it i'll look after arty trust me his pa be powerful disappointed if i didn't bring him along this time to say nothin of all the hands well well said the old lady in a voice of reluctant resignation i suppose it's all right but take care of him mart as if he was the apple of your eye it was a soft hazy melting day when mart and arty set out on their long drive the travelling was heavy but the air was delicious and our travellers were in the highest spirits this visit to the camp was arty's dearest treat and was allowed him three or four times during the winter toward noon the hazy blue of the morning sky changed to a thick gray while the air grew almost oppressively warm and the woods were filled on all sides with the strange innumerable noises of the great thaw the dull crunchings of the settling masses of snow at first thrilled the child with a vague alarm then reassured by his companion he grew interested in trying to distinguish the varied sounds the unbending of softened twigs and saplings the dropping of loosened bark the stealthy tricklings of unseen rillets all these filled the forest with a sense of mysterious activity and bustle every little while mart stopped to give the floundering horse rest and encouragement 
jerry belonged to steve doyle but being a great pet with his owner and devoted to the child and at the same time somewhat too old to endure without injury the hardships of winter lumbering he had been left at home in luxury the last two winters with nothing to do but make a weekly trip to the camp on the little st francis in all cases jerry was treated with affectionate consideration which he amply repaid by his intelligence and willingness when our weary travellers reached the top of the hill overlooking the camp jerry was pretty well fagged there was the camp however not half a mile away in its clearing at the end of a straight bit of road arty clapped his hands and stood up to see if he could catch a glimpse of his father looking out for him and mart chirruped cheerfully to the horse just at this moment the rain which had been threatening for hours came down it came down in sheets the horse was urged to a run but the travellers ere they reached the camp were drenched as if they had fallen in the river arty moreover was drenched in tears for a few moments on learning of his father's absence but soon with the delighted pettings and caressings of the three or four woodsmen who had been left in the camp the little fellow's disappointment was assuaged and he was making himself at home the camp however seemed to him lonely and deserted and when after supper getting the cook to wrap him up in an oilskin coat he went out to the stable to give jerry a big piece of camp gingerbread and bid him good night his disappointment welled up again and he gave way to a few more tears on the affectionate animal's neck around the blazing fire a little later arty was himself again the men sang songs for him and told him stories and blew little clouds of bitter smoke from their pipes into the brown thicket of his curls he sat now on one rough fellow's knee and now on another's and absorbed all the attention of the camp and was allowed by the cook to eat all the gingerbread he wanted when he got sleepy he was put into his father's bunk and since he was determined to have it so mart was allowed to sleep beside him arty having gone to bed there was nothing for his admirers to do but follow his example their hearts filled with tender memories and generous thoughts stirred up by the presence of the child among them the backswoodsmen turned into their bunks and soon were fast asleep that night the floods came the torrents rushing down every hillside speedily burst the already rotten ice some miles above the camp a jam formed itself early in the evening a mixed mass of ice cakes logs and rubbish and this kept the water below from rising rapidly enough to warn the camp of its danger just as the gray of dawn was beginning to struggle dimly through the forest aisles the jam broke and the mighty avalanche of ice and water swept down on the slumbering camp there was no warning men perished in their sleep crushed or drowned without knowing what had happened the camp was simply wiped out of existence the bunk in which arty lay asleep with his young protector was not built into the wall like the other bunks it was a separate structure and stood across the end of the building close by the fireplace when the flood struck the camp the stout building went down like a house of cards with a choking cry of terror arty awoke to find himself drifting in a tumult of icy waters great dark waves kept whirling eddying and crashing about him an arm was around him holding him firmly and he realized that mart was taking care of him presently a fragment of wreck plunged against them and he heard mart groan but the young man caught the timbers and bade arty lay hold of them the child bravely did as he was told and climbed actively upon the floating mass hardly had he done so when mart disappeared under the dark surface a shrill cry broke from arty's lips at the sight but in a moment the young man reappeared he was close against the timbers dashing against them in fact but arty saw that he was unable to hold on to them throwing himself flat on his face the plucky little fellow caught hold of his friend's sleeve and clung to it with all his tiny strength tiny as it was it was enough for the purpose however and mart's head was kept above water but his eyes were closed and he did not notice the child's voice begging him to climb up onto the wreck the waters subsided almost as rapidly as they had risen though the stream remained a torrent raging far above its wonted bounds in a few minutes the timbers on which arty had his refuge were swung by an eddy into shallow water they caught against a tree and then grounded at one end arty began crawling towards shore dragging mart's body through the water without great difficulty 
but when he got into the shallow part it was another matter he could not haul mart's weight any farther resting the young man's head on the edge of the timbers he paused to take breath and looked about him in despair now he began to cry again he had been too busy for lamentations while trying to save mart presently he heard some one approaching attracted by the sound of his voice looking up eagerly he saw it was old jerry picking his way through the shallow water he called him by name and the horse neighed joyfully in answer the animal was sadly bedraggled in appearance but evidently unhurt he had swum ashore lower down the river and was making his way back to where he expected to find the camp now however he came to arty sniffed him over and rubbed him with his soft wet nose jerry'll help pull mart out said the child aloud half to himself half to the horse and laying hold of the young man's sleeve he again began bravely tugging upon it pull too jerry urged the young fellow while the animal stood wondering what it was he was required to do in a moment however he understood and seizing the young man by the collar of his shirt he speedily dragged him to land without much help from arty the affectionate creature recognized his driver and stood over him with drooping head bewildered at his helplessness and silence mart opened his eyes and groaned slightly once or twice but immediately relapsed into unconsciousness arty sat down by his side his little heart overflowing with grief and fear he kept crying for his father and his grandmother and for mart to open his eyes jerry completed the sad group standing over it as if on guard and ever and anon lifting his head to send forth a shrill whinny of appeal this was the position in which a half hour later guided by jerry's signals steve doyle and his party found them doyle had not caught the lumber thieves the march of his party had been so retarded by the thaw that they had halted before going half way as the storm increased and they observed how the water was rising in the brook beside which they had encamped they became alarmed they realized the prospect of a big flood and steve doyle led his men back in hot haste it was full daylight when they came out upon the devastated clearing where once had stood the camp the horror of the lumbermen's hearts is not to be described in a pile of wreckage strangely mixed up with hay and straw from the stable they found the cook with a leg and an arm broken but still alive of no one else was there a sign nor of the horses from the cook doyle learned of arty's presence in the camp without a word but with a wild white face the man started downstream in a despairing search and the whole band followed with the exception of two that stayed to take care of the unfortunate cook when the father clasped arty in his arms he was almost beside himself with joy for a few moments then he remembered the poor fellows who were gone giving the child into the arms of one of the men he busied himself with mart whom by means of rubbing he soon brought back to consciousness the brave fellow had been stunned by a blow on the head and afterward half drowned but he soon recovered so far as to be able to walk with assistance to arty he owed his life even as he himself saved arty's a little later a melancholy procession started back for beardsley settlement the poor cook was placed on jerry's back and bore his pain like a hero arty trudged by the side of mccann to whose charge he was committed by his father and mart was helped along by two of his comrades with these went five or six more of the hands to get them safely to the settlement all the rest under the leadership of steve doyle set off down river on a search for the three missing men or their bodies and the site of the camp was left to its desolation as for doyle's search it proved fruitless and the party returned heavy-hearted henceforth the scene of the catastrophe became known throughout that region as lost camp and was sedulously avoided by the lumbermen next season the reichert company's camp on the little st francis was built on higher ground some miles farther upstream that's a most depressing tale queerman grumbled ranolph i suppose it's my turn now and thank goodness i've got something frivolous to tell heave ahead then urged Stranian. your title i demanded this is the tale of the cart before the steer replied ranolph the cart before the steer landry shouted squire bateman emerging from the big red door of the barn with a pitchfork in his hand landry an excitable little frenchman appeared suddenly around the woodhouse as if he had just been waiting to be called 
landry said the squire you're goin into kentville this mornin for that feed ain't you yes sir responded landry the farmer considered for a moment chewing thoughtfully on a head of wheat then he continued you'd better take the black and white steer along and leave him at murphy's as you pass he's fat now as he'll ever be and it's just a waste of feed to keep on stuffin the critter i'll have to take him sir queried landry oh replied the squire rather impatiently turning back into the barn hitch him to the back of the cart he'll lead all right on this point landry seemed doubtful he scratched his head anxiously for a moment and then darted off in his nervous way so unlike the deliberateness of hired men in general to carry out his employer's orders the black-and-white steer was a raw-boned beast about three years old with no disposition to take on fat there was a wild roving expression in his eyes which made landry who knew cattle well and appreciated the difference in their dispositions very doubtful as to his docility when being led to market in squire bateman's eyes however a steer was a steer and if one could be led so could another squire bateman had a constitutional hatred of exceptions when landry was ready to start he hitched the steer to the cart tail with a strong halter and set out with misgivings but the steer proved docility itself it trotted along in indolent good humour holding its head high and sniffing the fresh meadow-scented air with delight by the time they reached the top of barnes's hill a long descent about two miles this side of kentville landry had made up his mind that he had done the animal an injustice but just at this stage in the journey something took place as things will so long as fate remains the whimsical creature she is it chanced that a party of wheelmen from halifax on a tour through the cornwallis valley and the evangeline regions arrived at the top of the hill when landry and his charge were about halfway down the bicyclists were riding in a long line single file their leader knew the country and he knew that barnes's hill was smooth and safe for coasting some of the riders the leader among them were on the old-fashioned high wheels while others rode the less conspicuous safeties then a new thing each man as he dipped over the edge of the slope flung his legs over the handles and luxuriously let her go they saw the team ahead but there was abundance of room for safe passing now squire bateman's black and white steer had been brought up behind the gaspereau hills where the wheelman delights not to wander a bicycle therefore was in his eyes a novel and terrifying sight as the whirling and gleaming apparition flashed past he snorted fiercely and sprang aside with a violence that almost upset the cart landry sprang to his feet grinding his teeth with excitement and wrath and the next wheelman slipped radiantly by this was too much for the black and white steer and on the third wheel he made a desperate but ineffectual charge ineffectual did i say well only so far as that wheel was concerned but he flung himself so far across the way that the next rider could not avoid the obstacle the tall wheel struck the animal amidships so to speak and the rider went right on and landed in a dismal heap the other riders darted aside by the bank into the fence stopping themselves gracefully or ungracefully but at any cost avoiding the now quite demented beast that was blocking their way the animal made a frantic dash at the unfortunate wheelman in the gutter who had picked himself up with difficulty and was feeling for broken bones he was beyond the steer's reach but discreetly hobbled to the fence and placed that welcome barrier between him and the foe the fury of the animal's charge however had swung the cart right across the road and now the frightened horse began to plunge and rear landry held him in partial control and the next instant the steer made a second mad rush this time aiming at the bicycle which had struck him and which now lay in the gutter he reached the offending wheel but at the same time he upset the cart out went landry like a rubber ball and the horse kicking himself free of the traces set out at a highly creditable pace for kentville the rage of the little frenchman as he picked himself up was homeric he abused the bellowing and bounding brute with an eloquence which had it been expressed in english would have made the wheelman on the other side of the fence depart in horror then he seized a fence stake and rushed into close quarters resolved to enforce his authority at the moment of landry's attack the steer had his horns very much engaged in the wheel of the bicycle 
as the fence stake came down with impressive emphasis across his haunches he tossed the machine in air and charged on his assailant with great nimbleness and ferocity landry just escaped by springing over the body of the cart and at this juncture he congratulated himself that he had hitched the animal by a strong halter by this time the bicyclists had reunited their forces a little below their leader with the dismounted wheelman now came to rescue the suffering wheel but there was no such thing as getting near it the steer stood guard over his prize with an air that forbade any interference it isn't much good now anyway grumbled the victim i guess i'll have to hobble on as far as kentville and borrow or hire another wheel there this ain't worth mending now oh nonsense replied the leader a few dollars will put it all right we'll leave it at kentville to be sent back to halifax by the dar and machinaries fix it so you'll never know it had been broken well rejoined the discomfited one i don't see how we're going to get hold of it anyway to this sentiment the steer bellowed his adherence the leader of the wheelman however glancing around at the encouraging countenances of his party drew a small revolver from his hip pocket don't you think he said addressing landry we ought to shoot this beast he's blocking the highway and is a menace to all passers-by the astute landry meditated for a moment what might be your name sir he inquired my name's vroot walter vroot of halifax replied the wheelman if you shoot the steer there squire big money make you pay for him sure said landry at this there arose a chorus of indignation led by the discomfited one but mr vroot turned on his heel thrusting his revolver back into his pocket perhaps said he to landry you'll be so good as to bring the bicycle into kentville with you when you come there said landry oh is that possible i go to kentville right now to look after my horse in a few minutes the wheelman had vanished in a slender and gleaming line landry and the wheelless one whose name by the way was smith were tramping dejectedly townward and the steer was left in absolute possession of the cart the wheel and a portion of the queen's highway in a short time the situation might have become monotonous for the animal as the road was dry and dusty and the rich short grass of the roadside beyond his reach but just as he got tired of demolishing the bicycle there came a diversion a light carriage containing a lady and a gentleman appeared over the crest of the hill the occupants of the carriage were surprised and vexed at the obstacle before them i think it's perfectly outrageous said the lady the way these country people leave their vehicles right in the middle of the road there seems to have been some accident remarked the man soothingly what business had they going away and leaving things that way retorted the lady sharply you'll have to get out and remove that animal before we try to pass by this time the horse a mild livery stable creature was almost within reach of the angry steer whose tail twitched ominously the next instant with a deep grunting bellow he charged at the horse who reared and backed just in time to save himself the carriage came within an ace of upsetting and the lady shrieked hysterically the man sprang out and seized the horse by the head the lady flung herself out desperately over the back don't be alarmed my dear said the man the animal is securely fastened to the cart and seems to have been placed there to guard the way they seem to have very strange customs in nova scotia what shall we do queried the lady tearfully gazing at the pawing and roaring steer why there's nothing to do but take down a piece of the fence and drive around there's no occasion for alarm replied the man he backed the horse a little way and then tied him to the fence while he made an opening then he made another opening at a safe distance below the obstacle led the horse and carriage through put the lady back into the seat and continued his journey philosophically in the course of the next hour a number of other travellers approached and taking in the situation followed the new route through the fields the steer invariably bellowed and plunged and lashed himself into mad rage in trying to get at them but squire bateman's halter and rope did their duty and all his efforts proved futile but meanwhile the most astounding reports were flying about kentville landry had secured the horse and related the exact truth of the whole affair but the various romantic and exciting embellishments of wayfarers found most favour in the eventless country town a little squad of men with guns set forth to quell the nuisance and hard on their heels followed landry bent on saving the property of his employer 
when the party drew near and realized how securely their antagonist was tethered they were in no haste to complete their errand the brute's rage was so blind and fierce that they amused themselves for a little while with the sport of tantalizing him they would approach almost within his reach and then dart back to a safer-looking distance and presently the animal was a mass of sweat and froth churned with red dust of the highway at last just as one of the men raised his rifle with the intention of ending the play the animal threw himself in one of his maddest charges landry had just come up the instant the steer fell he rushed forward threw his coat over its head and knotted the arms under its jaws breathless and bewildered the panting brute ceased its struggles and lay quite still in a moment or two it was lifted to its feet the halter was unhitched from the cart tail and landry set out for kentville with the blindfolded steer following as gently as a lamb End of chapter three part two chapter four of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four more of camp de Squatook. part one on the following morning we breakfast in a very leisurely fashion with a delightful sense of having all day before us we spent the day in casting our flies at the outlet and our success was a continual repetition of that of the previous night only stranion grew tired he could not hook as many fish as the rest of us wherefore he grew disgusted and chose to sit on the bank deriding us but as long as the fish were feeding we heeded him not our heaviest trout that day just cleared two pounds and a half in the evening we took tea early before settling down we made a little voyage of exploration to the top of a neighboring hill and watched the moon rise over the vast and empty wilderness returning to the camp we doffed our scanty garments ran down the beach and dashed out into the gleaming lake waters it was such a swim as stranion had told us of after this we felt royally luxurious we lolled upon our blankets with a lordly air and the soughing of the pines was all about us for music then in a peremptory tone sam cried stranion sir to you was stranion's polite response stranion continued sam to you it falls to unfold to this appreciative audience the resources of your experience or your imagination i would recommend now a judicious combination of the two thus irresistibly adjured stranion began this is the story of lou's clarionet said he judge ye whether i speak from experience or imagination it was a christmas eve service in the second westcock church the church at second westcock was quaint and old-fashioned like the village over which it presided its shingles were gray with the beating of many winters its little square tower was surmounted by four spindling posts like the legs of a table turned heavenward its staring windows were adorned with curtains of yellow cotton its uneven and desolate churchyard strewn with graves and snowdrifts occupied a bleak hillside looking out across the bay to the lonely height of shepherdy mountain down the long slope below the church straggled the village half lost in the snow and whistled over by the winds of the bay of fundy second westcock was an outlying corner of the rector's expansive parish and a christmas eve service there was an event almost unparalleled to give a second westcock this service the rector had forsaken his prosperous congregation at westcock sackville and dorchester driving some eight or ten miles through the snows and solitude of the deep dorchester woods and because the choir at second westcock was not remarkable even for willingness much less for strength or skill he had brought with him his fifteen-year-old niece lou allison to swell the christmas praise with the notes of her clarionet the little church was lighted with oil lamps ranged along the white wall between the windows the poor bare chancel a red cloth covered kitchen table in a semicircle of paintless railing was flanked by two towering pulpits of white pine on either side the narrow carpetless aisle were rows of unpainted benches on the left were gathered solemnly the men of the congregation each looking straight ahead 
on the right were the women whispering and scanning each other's bonnets till the appearance of the rector from the little vestry room by the door should bring silence and reverent attention in front of the women's row stood the melodeon and the two benches behind it were occupied by the choir the male members of which sat blushingly self-conscious proud of their office but deeply abashed at the necessity of sitting among the women there was no attempt at christmas decoration for second westcott had never been awakened to the delicious excitements of the church greening at last the rector appeared in his voluminous white surplice he moved slowly up the aisle and mounted the winding steps of the right-hand pulpit and as he did so his five-year-old son forsaking his place by lou's side marched forward and seated himself resolutely on the pulpit steps he did not feel quite at home in second westcott church the sweet old carol while shepherds watch their flocks by night rose rather doubtfully from the little choir who looked and listened askance at the glittering clarionet into which lou was now blowing softly lou was afraid to make herself distinctly heard at first lest she should startle the singers but in the second verse the pure vibrant notes came out with confidence and then for two lines the song was little more than a duet between lou and the rector's vigorous baritone in the third verse however it all came right the choir felt and responded to the strong support and thrilling stimulus of the instrument and at length ceased to dread their own voices the naked little church was glorified with the sweep of triumphal song pulsating through it never before had such music been heard there men and women and children sang from their very souls and when the hymn was ended the whole congregation stood for some seconds as in a dream with quivering throats till the rector's calm voice repeating the opening words of the liturgy brought back their self-control in some measure thereafter every hymn and chant and carol was like an inspiration and lou's eyes sparkled with exultation when the service was over the people gathered round the stove by the door praising lou's clarionet and petting little ted who had by this time come down from the pulpit steps one old lady gave the child two or three brown sugar biscuits which she had brought in her pocket and a pair of red mittens which she had knitted for him as a christmas present turning to lou the old lady said i never heerd nothin like that trumpet o yourn miss i felt like it just drawed down to angels from heaven to sing with us to-night their voices was all swimmin in a smoke like right up in the hollow o the ceiling tain't a trumpet interrupted teddy shyly it's a clarionet i got a trumpet at home to be sure replied the old lady indulgently but miss as i was a sayin that music o yourn would just soften the hardest hearts as ever was the rector had just come from the vestry room well wrapped up in his furs and was shaking hands and wishing every one a merry christmas while the sexton brought the horse to the door he overheard the old lady's last remark as she was bundling teddy up in a huge woolen muffler oh, i certainly did said he make the singing go magnificently to-night didn't it mrs tate but i wonder now what sort of an effect it would produce on a hard-hearted bear if such a creature should come out at us while we were going through dorchester woods the mild pleasantry was very delicately adapted to the rector's audience and the group about the stove smiled with a reverent air befitting the place they were in but the old lady exclaimed in haste my land sakes possum the bear just scared to death i wonder if it would frighten a bear thought lou to herself as they were getting snugly bundled into the warm deep pung as the low box sleigh with movable seats is called soon the crest of the hill was passed and the four-poster on the top of second westcott church sank out of sight for a mile or more the road led through half-cleared pasture lands where the black stumps stuck up so strangely through the drifts that teddy discovered bears on every hand he was not at all alarmed however for he was sure his father was a match for a thousand bears by and by the road entered the curious inverted dark of the dorchester woods where all the light seemed to come from the white snow under the trees rather than from the dark sky above them at this stage of the journey teddy retired beneath the buffalo robes and went to sleep in the bottom of the pung the horse jogged slowly along the somewhat heavy road 
the bells jingled drowsily amid the soft pushing whisper of the runners lou and the rector talked in quiet voices attuned to the solemn hush of the great forest what's that lou shivered up closer to the rector as she spoke and glanced nervously into the dark woods whence a sound had come he did not answer at once but seized the whip and tightened the reins as a signal to old jerry to move on faster the horse needed no signal but awoke into an eager trot which would have become a gallop had the rector permitted again came the sound this time a little nearer and still apparently just abreast of the pung but deep in the woods it was a bitter long wailing cry blended with a harshly grating undertone like the rasping of a saw what is it again asked lou her teeth chattering the rector let old jerry out into a gallop as he answered i'm afraid it's a panther what they call around here an indian devil but i don't think there is any real danger it is a ferocious beast but will probably give us a wide berth why won't it attack us asked lou oh it prefers solitary victims replied the rector it is ordinarily a cautious beast and does not understand the combination of man and horse and vehicle only on rare occasions has it been known to attack people driving and this one will probably keep well out of our sight however it's just as well to get beyond its neighbourhood as quickly as possible steady jerry old boy steady don't use yourself up too fast the rector kept the horse well in hand but in a short time it was plain that the panther was not avoiding the party the cries came nearer and nearer and lou's breath came quicker and quicker and the rector's teeth began to set themselves grimly while his brows gathered in anxious thought if it should come to a struggle what was there in the slave he was wondering that would serve as a weapon nothing absolutely nothing but his heavy pocket-knife a poor weapon thought he ruefully with which to fight a panther but he felt in his pocket with one hand and opened the knife and slipped it under the edge of the cushion beside him at this instant he caught sight of the panther bounding along through the low underbrush keeping parallel with the road and not forty yards away there it is came in a terrified whisper from lou's lips and just then teddy lifted his head from under the robes frightened at the speed and at the set look on his father's face he began to cry the panther heard him and turned at once toward the sleigh old jerry stretched himself out in a burst of extra speed while the rector grasped his poor knife fiercely and the panther came with a long leap right into the road not ten paces behind the flying sleigh teddy stared in amazement then cowered down in fresh terror as there came an ear-splitting screech wild and high and long from lou's clarionet lou had turned and over the back of the seat was blowing this peal of desperate defiance in the brute's very face the astonished animal shrank back in his tracks and sprang again into the underbrush lou turned to the rector with a flushed face of triumph and the rector exclaimed in a husky voice thank god but teddy between his sobs complained what'd you do that for lou lou jumped to the conclusion that her victory was complete and final but the rector kept jerry at his top speed and scrutinized the underwood apprehensively the panther appeared again in four or five minutes returning to the road and leaping along some forty or fifty feet behind the sleigh his pace was a very curious disjointed india rubber spring which rapidly closed up on the fugitives then round swung lou's long instrument again and at its piercing cry the animal again shrank back this time however he kept to the road and the moment lou paused for breath he resumed the chase save your breath child exclaimed the rector as lou again put the slender tube to her lips save your breath and let him have it ferociously when he begins to get too near the animal came within twenty or thirty feet again and then lou greeted him with an ear-splitting blast and he fell back again and again the tactics were repeated lou tried a thrilling cadenza it was too much for the brute's nerves he could not comprehend a girl with such a penetrating voice and he could not screw up his courage to a closer investigation of the marvel at last the animal seemed to resolve on a change of procedure plunging into the woods he made an effort to get ahead of the sleigh 
old jerry was showing signs of exhaustion but the rector roused him to an extra spurt and there just ahead was the opening of Fillmore's settlement blow lou blow shouted the rector and as the panther made a dash to intercept the sleigh it found itself in too close proximity to the strange-voiced phenomenon in the pung and sprang backward with an angry snarl as lou's breath failed from her dry lips the sleigh dashed out into the open a dog bayed angrily from the nearest farmhouse and the panther stopped short on the edge of the wood the rector drove into the farmyard and old jerry stopped shivering as if he would fall between the shafts after the story had been told and jerry had been stabled and rubbed down the rector resumed his journey with a fresh horse having no fear that the panther would venture across the cleared lands three of the settlers started out forthwith and following the tracks in the new snow succeeded in shooting the beast after a chase of two or three hours the adventure supplied the countryside all that winter with a theme for conversation and about lou's clarionet there gathered a halo of romance that drew rousing congregations to the parish church where its music was to be heard every alternate sunday evening i should say remarked queerman that to experience and imagination you combine a most tenacious memory who would have dreamed that the shy teddy with his proclivity for the pulpit steps would have developed into the stranian that we see before us to this there was no reply then suddenly magnus said sam and sam began at once this is all about jake dimble's wooden leg said sam one evening in the early summer i won't say how many years ago jake dimble was driving the cows home from pasture at that time jake a stout youth of seventeen had no thought of such an appendage as a wooden leg indeed he had no place to put one had he possessed such a thing for his own vigorous legs of bone and muscle with which he had been born and with which he had grown up in entire content seemed likely to serve him for the rest of his natural life but that very evening amid the safe quiet and soft colours of the upland cow pasture fate was making ready a lesson for him in the possibilities of the unexpected in westmoreland county that summer bears were looked upon as a drug in the market the county indeed seemed to be suffering from an epidemic of bears but so far these woody pastures of second westcock surrounded by settlements had apparently escaped the contagion when therefore jake was startled by an angry growl coming from a swampy thicket on his right the thought of a bear did not immediately occur to him he saw that the cows were running ahead with a sudden alertness but he paused and gazed at the thicket wondering whether it would be wise for him to go and investigate the source of the sound while he hesitated the question was decided for him a large black bear burst forth from the bushes with a crash that carried a nameless terror into jake's very soul the beast looked so cruelly out of place so horribly out of place breaking in upon the beauty and security of the familiar scene jake had no weapon more formidable than the hazel switch he was carrying and the pocket-knife with which he was trimming off its branches after one long horrified look at the bear jake took to flight along the narrow cowpath jake was a notable runner in those days yet the bear gained upon him rapidly the cowpath was tortuous exceedingly and away from the path the ground was too rough for fast running at least jake found it so the bear did not seem to mind the irregularities jake envied the cows their fine head start he wished he was with them then as he heard the bear getting closer he almost wished he was one of them and then his foot caught in a root and he fell headlong as he fell a great wave of despair went over him and a thought flashed through his mind this is the end of me his sight was darkened for an instant as he rolled in the moss and twigs between two hillocks then turning upon his back he saw the bear already hanging over him and now a desperate courage came to his aid raising his heels high in the air he brought them down with violence in the brute's face the animal started back astonished at this novel method of defence when it advanced again to the attack jake met it desperately with his heels 
and all the time he kept up a lusty shouting such as he hoped would soon bring some one to the rescue for a few minutes strange to say jake's tactics were successful in keeping his foe at bay but presently the bear growing more angry or more hungry made a fiercer assault and succeeded in catching the lad's foot between his jaws the brave fellow sickened under the cruel grip of those crunching teeth but he kept up the fight with his free heel just as he was about fainting with pain and exhaustion some farmers who had heard the outcry arrived upon the scene and the bear hastily withdrew that night there was a bear hunt at second westcock but it brought no spoils bruin had made an effective disappearance as for jake his foot and the lower part of his leg were so dreadfully mangled that the leg had to be cut off just below the knee when the lad was entirely recovered being a handy fellow he made himself a new leg of white oak around the bottom of which to prevent wear he hammered a stout iron ring the years went by in their usual surreptitious fashion and brought few changes to second westcock one june evening ten years after that on which my story opened jake was driving the cows home as usual when once more as he passed the swampy thicket he heard that menacing growl jake looked about him as if in a dream there was the same dewy smell in the air mingled with the fragrance of sweet fern that he remembered so painfully and so well there was the same long yellow cloud over the black woods to the west there was the same dappled sky of amber and violet over his head as before he saw the cows breaking into a run in a moment there was the same dreadful crashing in the thicket was he dreaming he looked down in bewilderment and his eyes fell on the iron-shod end of his wooden leg that settled it evidently he was not dreaming and it was time for him to hurry home he broke into a run as rapid as his wooden leg would allow now long use and natural dexterity had made jake almost as active in the handling of this wooden leg as most men are with the limbs which nature gave them but with his original legs in their pristine vigor he had found himself no match for a bear what then could he expect in the present instance jake looked over his shoulder and beheld the bear hot on his tracks he could have sworn it was the same bear as of old he made up his mind to run no more but to save his breath for what he felt might be his last fight he gave a series of terrific yells which as he thought might pierce even to the corner grocery under the hill and threw himself flat on his back on a gentle hummock that might pass for a post of advantage jake was not hopeful but he was firm he thought it would be too much to expect to come off twice victorious from a scrape like this he eyed the bear sternly and it seemed to him as if the brute actually smiled on observing that its intended victim had not forgotten his ancient tactics jake concluded that the approaching contest was likely to be fatal to himself but he calculated on making it at least unpleasant for the bear the animal turned a little to one side and attacked his prostrate antagonist in the flank but jake whirled nimbly just in time and brought down his iron-shod heel on the brute snout the blow was a heavy one but that bear was not at all surprised if it was the bear of the previous encounter it doubtless argued that years had brought additional weight and strength to its opponent's understanding it was not to be daunted but instantly seized the wooden leg and its angry jaws jake's yells for help continued but the bear the moment it discovered that the limb on which it was chewing was of good white oak fell a prey to astonishment if not alarm it dropped the leg backed off a few paces sat down upon its haunches and gazed at this strange and inedible species of man jake realized at once the creature's bewilderment but the crisis was such a painful one that the humor of the situation failed to strike him after a few moments of contemplation the bear made a fresh attack it was hungry and perhaps thought some other portion of jake's body might prove more delicate eating than his leg jake however gave it no chance to try the next hole the bear got was upon the very end of the oaken member where the iron ring proved little to its taste 
it tried fiercely for another hold but jake in his desperate struggles endowed with the strength of his terror succeeded in foiling it in every attempt at length with the utmost force of his powerful thigh he drove the end of the leg right into the beast's open mouth inflicting a serious wound blood flowed freely from the animal's throat and presently after a moment of hesitation having probably concluded that the morsel was not savoury enough to justify any further struggle the bear moved sullenly away coughing and whining jake lay quite still till his vanquished antagonist had disappeared in the covert then he rose and wended his way homeward thinking to himself how much better his wooden leg had served him than an ordinary one could have done in a few minutes he was met by some of his fellow townsmen who were hastening to find out the cause of all the noise to them jake related the adventure with great elation adding as he concluded you see now how everything turns out for the best if i hadn't lost that ere leg o' mine this night ten year ago i'd have maybe lost my head this very evening in spite of jake dimble's reputation for truthfulness his story was not believed in the village of second westcock it was voted altogether too improbable from whatever side it was looked at in fact so profoundly incredulous were his fellow villagers that jake could not even organize a bear hunt some ten days later however his veracity received ample confirmation a man out looking for strayed cattle in the woods not more than a couple of miles from jake's pasture found a large bear lying dead in a cedar swamp examining the body curiously to find the cause of death he was puzzled till he recalled jake's story then he looked at the dead brute's throat the mystery was solved and the community was once for all convinced of the fighting qualities of the wooden leg well, that's a good story said magnus in a vague way it reminds me of one which is as unlike it as anything could well be mine is a tropical tale let the o m enter it as peril among the pearls i got it at first hand when i was in halifax last autumn in the tiny office of the Cunarder inn the air was thick with smoke the white egg-shaped stove contained a fire though september was yet young for a raw night fog had rolled in over halifax making the display of bright coals no less comforting than cheerful from the adjacent wharves came the soft washing and whispering of the tide with an occasional rattle of oars as a boat came to land from one of the many ships the density of the atmosphere in the office was chiefly due to al johnson the diver who when he was not talking diving eating or sleeping was sure to be puffing at his pipe we had talked little but now i resolved to turn off the smoke flowing from johnson's pipe by getting him to tell us a story he could never tell a story and keep his pipe lit at the same time johnson was a college-bred man whom a love of adventure had lured into deep-sea diving he and his partner were at this time engaged in recovering the cargo of a steamer ulrich sunk near the entrance to halifax harbour i asked johnson do you remember promising me a yarn about an adventure you had in the pearl fisheries which adventure and what pearl fisheries johnson asked i fished in tonnevelly and in the sulu waters off the borneo coast and also in the torres strait and wheresoever it was there seemed to be pretty nearly always some excitement going oh said i whichever you like to give us i think what you spoke of was an adventure in the torrey strait no said johnson i think i'll give you a little yarn about a tussle i had with a turtle in the sulu waters i fancy there isn't much that grows but you'll find it somewhere in borneo and the water there is just as full of life as the land sharks i queried oh worse than sharks replied johnson there's a big squid that will squirt the water black as ink and just then perhaps something comes along and grabs you when you can't defend yourself and there's the devil fish own cousin to the squid and the meanest enemy you'll want to run across anywhere and there's a tremendous giant of a shellfish a kind of scalloped clam that lies with its huge shells wide open but half hidden in the long weeds and sea mosses if you put your foot into that trap snap it closes on you and you're fast 
that clam is a good deal stronger than you are and if you have not a hatchet or something to smash the shell with you are likely to stay there of course your partner in the boat up aloft would soon know something was wrong finding that he couldn't haul you up then he would go down after you and chop you loose perhaps but meanwhile it would be far from nice especially if a shark came along if another clam does not nab him for one of these big clams has been known to catch even a shark many natives thereabouts do a lot of diving on their own account and of course don't indulge in diving suits i can tell you they are very careful not to fall afoul of these clam shells for when they do they're drowned before they can get clear you can hardly blame the clam or whatever it is said i it must be rather a shock to its nerves when it feels a big foot thrust down right upon its stomach no assented johnson you can't blame the clam but besides the clam there is a big turtle that is a most officious creature with a beak that will almost cut railroad iron it is forever poking that beak into whatever it thinks it doesn't know all about and you cannot scare it as you can a shark you have simply got to kill it before it will acknowledge itself beaten these same turtles however at the top of the water or on dry land would in most cases prove as timid as rabbits and then as you say there are the sharks all kinds big and little forever hungry but not half so courageous as they get the credit of being i suppose i interrupted you always carried a weapon of some sort well rather said johnson for my own part i took a great fancy to the ironwood stakes that the natives always use but they don't seem to me quite the thing for smashing those big shells with supposing a fellow should happen to put his foot into one so i made myself a stake with a steel top which answered every purpose more than one big shark have i settled with that handspike of mine and once i found to my great advantage that it was just the thing to break up a shell with ha ha laughed best who had been listening rather inattentively here too so you put your foot in it did you yes i did said johnson and that is just what i'm going to tell you about i was working that season with a good partner a likely young fellow hailing from auckland he tended the line and the pump to my complete satisfaction i've never had a better tender also i was teaching him to dive and he took to it like a loon his name was larry scott and if he had lived he would have made a record he was killed about a year after the time i'm telling you of in a row down in new orleans but we won't stop to talk about that now as i was saying larry and i pulled together pretty well from the start and we were so lucky with our fishing that the fellows in the other boats began to get jealous and unpleasant you must know that all kinds go to the pearl fisheries and the worst kinds have rather the best of it in point of numbers we were ready enough to fight but we liked best to go our own way peaceably so when some of the other lads got quarrelsome we just smiled hoisted our sail and looked up a new ground for ourselves some little distance from the rest of the fleet luck being on our side just then we chanced upon one of the finest beds in the whole neighbourhood one morning as i was poking about among the seaweed and stuff i came across a fine-looking bunch of pearl shells i made a grab at them but they were firmly rooted and refused to come away i laid down my handspike took hold of the cluster with both hands and shifted my foothold so as to get a good chance to pull up came the bunch of shells at the first wrench much more readily than i had expected to recover myself i took a step backward down went my foot into a crevice slumped into something soft and snap my leg was fast in the grip that almost made me yell there in the little prison of my helmet well as you may imagine just as soon as i recovered from the start this gave me i reached out for my handspike to knock that clamshell into flinders but a cold shiver went over me as i found i could not reach the weapon as i laid it down it had slipped a little off to one side and there it rested about a foot out of my reach reclining on one of those twisted conch shells such as the farmers use for dinner horns how i jerked on my leg trying to pull it out of the trap that however only hurt the leg all the satisfaction i could get was in the thought that my foot with its big twenty-pound rubber and lead boot must be making the clam's internal affairs rather uncomfortable 
after i had pretty well tired myself out stretching and tugging on my leg and struggling to reach the handspike i paused to recover my wind and consider the situation it was not very deep water i was working in and there was any amount of light you have no sort of idea until you have been there yourself what a queer world it is down where the pearl oyster grows the seaweeds were all sorts of colors or rather i should say they were all sorts of reds and yellows and greens the rest of the colors of the rainbow you might find in the shells which lay around underfoot or went crawling among the weeds and away overhead darted and flashed the queerest looking fish like birds in a yellow sky there were lots of big anemones too waving stretching and curling their many-coloured tentacles i saw everything with extraordinary vividness about that time as i know by the clear way i recollect it now but you may be sure i wasn't thinking much just then about the beauties of nature i was trying to think of some way of getting assistance from larry at length i concluded i had better give him the signal to haul me up finding that i was stuck he would i reasoned hoist the anchor and then pull the boat along to the place of my captivity then he could easily send me down a hatchet wherewith to chop my way to freedom just as i had come to this resolve a black shadow passed over my head and i looked up quickly it was a big turtle i didn't like this i can tell you but i kept pretty still hoping the newcomer would not notice me he paddled along very slowly with his queer little head stuck far out and presently he noticed my air tube it seemed to strike him as decidedly queer my blood fairly turned to ice in my veins as i saw him paddle up and take hold of it in a gingerly fashion with his beak luckily he didn't seem to think it would be good to eat but i knew that if he should bite it i would be a dead man in about a minute drowned inside my helmet like a rat in a hole it is in an emergency like this that a man learns to know what real terror is in my desperation i stooped down and tore with both hands at the shells and weeds for something i might hurl at the turtle thinking thus perhaps to distract his attention from my air tube but what do you suppose happened why i succeeded in pulling up a great lump of shells and stones all bedded together the mass was fully two feet long my heart gave a leap of exultation for i knew at once just what to do with the instrument thus providentially placed in my hands instead of trying to hurl it at the turtle i reached out with it and managed to scrape that precious handspike within grasp as i gathered it once more into my grip i straightened up and was a man again just at this juncture the turtle decided to take a hand in i had given the signal to be hauled up at the very moment when i got hold of that lump of stones and now i could feel larry tugging energetically on the rope the turtle left off fooling with the tube and paddling down to see what was making such a commotion in the water he tackled me at once as it happened however he took hold of the big copper nut on the top of the headpiece and that was too tough a morsel even for his beak so that all he could do was to shake me a bit with him at my head and the clam on my leg and larry jerking on my waistband you may imagine i could hardly call my soul my own however i began jabbing my handspike for all i was worth into the unprotected parts of the turtle's body feeling around for some vital spot which is a thing mighty hard to find in a turtle in a moment the water was red with blood but that made no great difference to me and for a while it didn't seem to make much difference to the turtle either all i could do was to keep on jabbing as close to the neck as i could and between the front flippers and the turtle kept on chewing at the copper joint i believe it was the clam that helped me most effectually in that struggle you see that grip on my leg kept me as steady as a rock if it hadn't been for that the turtle would have had me off my feet and end over end in no time and would probably have soon got the best of me as it was after a few moments of this desperate stabbing with the handspike i managed to kill my assailant but even in death that iron beak of his maintained its hold on the copper nut of my helmet having no means of cutting the brute's head off i turned my attention to the big clam and with the steel point of my handspike i soon released my foot then larry hauled me up 
he told me afterward he never in all his life got such a start as when that great turtle came to the surface hanging on to the top of my helmet the creature was so heavy he could not haul it and me together into the boat so he slashed the head off with a hatchet and then lifted me aboard beyond a black and blue leg i was not much the worse for that adventure but i was so used up with excitement of it all that i wouldn't go down for any more pearls that day we took a day off larry and i and indulged in a little run ashore you had earned it said i now queerman said sam as your turn comes round again give us something less lugubrious than your last be light be cheerful it seems to me that i remember replied queerman a merry little adventure that befell me some years ago if it is not hilarious enough to suit you sam you can stop me in the middle of it while you fellows were fishing this afternoon i was reading mr gummer's handbook of poetics without by any means endorsing all that he says i was struck by many imaginative passages in one place he says something dimly personal stood behind the flash of lightning the roaring of the wind that is suggestive i'll tell you a case in point from my own experience in newfoundland let me call the story the dogs of the drift End of chapter 4, part 1